Um, so kicking off first, um, we're going to have David Millman uh, from NYU. He's the assistant dean to, now i got to put my glasses on, <laughs> to Digital Library um, Technical Services at New York University, um, who's working on a project um, together with Evident Point. So um, he will be speaking, and then Juan Corona will be demoing. Um, our second speaker is Kathy Fletcher. She's the technical director for OpenStax. Um, she'll be followed by Nathan Lisko, who's the senior Drupal, Drupal developer for eLife. And um, finally, uh, batting cleanup will be Drew Wingnut. From, uh, he's a software engineer for, and project manager for Mirador. He'll be telling us about annotation of images. Take it away. Hi, I'm David Millman. Um, the piece of the uh, ecosystem that, that we want to show you today is, is annotating books. Um, uh, I'm from the uh, NYU Digital Library Technology Services, and we're working uh, in the context of a project called Creating the Architecture for Enhanced Network Monographs, uh, funded by uh, the Mellon Foundation. And um, <clears throat> what we're doing is trying to, uh, to make uh, scholars do what they usually do in discourse around monographs, uh, updated to the internet. Um, so, so our values are pretty traditional. It's just we're, we're infrastructure providers in the library. We want to provide a stable platform that is citable, that does preservation for scholars now and in the future, um, and enables the kind of discourse that people had been able to do traditionally with print. So we're just trying to update the old fashioned into into how uh, people work with monographs, uh, how they could work with monographs today. Uh, there are a couple of interesting coincidences that have to do with the, the way our press works. The NYU Press reports to the library, so they're a customer of ours for, for, uh, what, uh, for providing infrastructure. Um, they are not a journal publisher. They, they publish monographs, uh, and they're not a science publisher, so we have a couple of interesting uh, you know, things related to the, the kinds of materials that are available from our press. So they're humanities monographs, and so that's, that's what, the, the, uh, what we're starting with. Um, we're doing a couple of things in addition to annotation. We have, uh, because they're humanities monographs, we want people to be able to navigate around them in um, uh, using the kind of language that that uh, that is appropriate for the field that they're in. So, um, what we've done is uh, a little semantic indexing work that takes um, uh, indexes back of the book indexes created by people and and combining them into a meta index. And you heard. Uh, people talking in uh, the panel yesterday about uh, the imprecision even in scientific literature and you know in humanities literature the meaning of words is even even uh, e even more difficult to pin down so this indexing of indexing is one way for people to navigate across a corpus and then we want to encourage discourse uh, between scholars and in teaching uh, through annotation and so uh, so then we've been working with Evident Point uh, to do uh, annotation in monographs, and uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Juan, who will show you how that's how far along we are. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, so I'm Juan Corona, and uh, we want to talk about annotating EPUB 3 publications. Um, I work for Evident Point Software. We um, we develop EPUB readers and so on. We want to give a voice to uh, web readers and publishers of published content, so it works with EPUB technology. Just, I have this slide here, just in case you don't know what an EPUB is, but in, if you do, this sets the stage for me. So EPUB is a format for eBooks. It's very popular. Um, books can have layouts, reflowable. Reflowable layouts are kind of the killer feature. Um, but they can be more precise, like in PDFs. But unlike PDFs, they work with web technology. Um, so it's eff effectively a packaged website. You know, you have an ordered collection of HTML with assets and so on. It's a standard made by the IDPF, the International Digital Publishing Forum. Uh, it was recently merged with W3C. They're coming up with evolutionary new standards, and we're really excited about that. Um, so web annotations for EPUB, why now? Well, I mentioned that we're excited about the W3C merger. Um, 
And uh, the cool thing is that the publishing group also includes the uh, web annotation working group. So um, there are two groups, um, the, and they're working collaborating at the spec level. Um, so why not, um, why not have the people who uh, work with the implementations that make the implementations work together too? So, um, and that's, that's what we've set out to do. Um, so who is involved? Um, let me tell you a little bit about us. Um, we've been making, uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, EPUB, EPUB and ebook related software for a long time now. We have, uh, we're pretty excited and to bring our expertise to this community. Um, so we've, we've been looking into the advancements that have been made in the open platform at a global community scale, and we want, we want to join um, that effort too. And with the help of NYU and Hypothesis, that's, and this, with this project, we're hoping to make a first step in that, uh, in that path. Um, so yeah, I mentioned NYU, David. Um, we want to, well, we want to make a system that, you know, you could annotate ebooks. Um, and like, like David mentioned, this is going to be a part of a larger system. So, you know, in order to not steal your thunder, I'm just going to not talk too much about that. Um, so I'm going to show you uh, what we built with current technology. So what's available now, there is this project called Redium that um, lets you provide a full reading uh, web experience, a full reading experience in the web. Um, and Evident Point actually built the first few iterations of the Redium web uh, EPUB reading system. Um, so we've been involved with that project since its inception and NYU uses Redium to provide this web reading experiences to their users. So it was, you know, it made sense that, you know, we got together and worked on something like that. And we chose uh, Hypothesis because, you know, it's the most prominent platform. It's well established, has good technology. Um, so what, what do we need to do? Um, there is a, we, we hit a problem right off the gate. Um, hypothesis, like some of you have probably n seen or noticed that if there's content inside an iframe, such as you have an I PDF inside an iframe that it doesn't really work right now with Hypothesis. We saw that same issue with, with EPUBs being inside an iframe. That's how it works right now with the, cur with the current technology. Um, so we had to make that work as if it was a, like a, a, you know, a web app that is not serving static content, but the content is loading in, loading out. Um, and we needed to do other things too, like how to identify resources, how to identify the EPUB uh, um, publications and their locations, and how to do the, you know, the precise selector level targeting of the content when an annotation needs, for example, the range of text that's selected and, and so on. So I don't want to get too technical, um, but just to give you a brief idea, these are some of the implementation challenges that we've been kind of going through. Um, you, we've been seeing issues with the, U, we've, you know, we need to make decisions on the UI, UX, the, you know, the hypothesis and the W3C standards don't really kind of show us how that could be done with EPUBs, so we need to make EPUBs fit in. Um, you know, in a simple example, if when we list something in the sidebar for hypothesis, are we showing the user all of the annotations in this book? Are we just narrowing it down, uh, you know, grouping it at the chapter level? What kind of, you know, UI, UX changes need to happen there? Um, how do EPUBs fit in into the annotation data model? What's the best thing to use as the URI? Um, do we identify the package or the content document and so on? So let me step out here and show you a quick demo of a uh, hypothesis working with, uh, you know, with Redium. And here it is. Um, as you can see, we're in a chapter called Accessibility and Usability. Oh, sorry, let me move it. Thank you. <laughs> change that. How do I make it go next display? All right. 
Deus vai dar isso. Hold on, let me switch the display. Okay, is that better? Okay, so we're in a chapter right now, um, and the screen got bigger, so you get to see more, and this is how reflowable EPUBs work. Um, we're in one chapter, and we see in the sidebar here that there are a couple of annotations. Uh, the sidebar is not really showing the UI perfectly yet, like I mentioned, but you can go ahead and annotate some content. Um, and right now, this, the sidebar is showing you know, all of the annotations in the whole book. Um, but you know, we have something working. Um, you can scroll through some of the annotations. You can't navigate to them yet, but the, we're working on that. Um, but if you do find one that's on the page like right now, um, the focus does change. That's why you saw one of them you know, turn blue and, and yellow. And if we flip the page, we can see that um, you know, you know, everything works like we expect it to. And um, the numbers on the sidebar are changing, and, and so on. So, you know, this is our work in progress. We're pretty excited about the, the technical uh, changes that are going to come into uh, Hypothesis. We're hoping to contribute this all as open source. So to move along, I will go back to my presentation here, if I can figure out how to do that. So like, like I mentioned, this is open, open platforms, open source. Uh, we're going to contribute everything. And now let's, um, I want to show you on the other side of the coin what our idea for our, you know, adding a layer to published content looks like with our 10 years of experience as evident point. So we have a platform, our own platform. And um, we've kind of been building annotation systems like I said, um, but you know they've been proprietary and uh, our own, and and you know um, just for our customers. So, but we we have a way of of adding new layers to on top of publications. We have annotations that are um, that you know the the idea is to enrich and add new content on top of a pub, you know post publicated content um, to engage students. Uh, teachers, uh, that's why our product was called, you know, Active Textbook. That was our first vision, um, but it's expanded more to support other types of use cases for authors, you know, reviewers, internal documentation for uh, enterprises, and so on. So we have different types of annotations. Um, we have comments, notes, highlights, of course, but we also have rectangular regions. Uh, we can create an annotation where you can link some media, some widget, and it'll show up in a pop-up. Uh, users can collaborate at, on their own um, at, the, at the book level locally, or they can share their book, make a new version of that book, send it off to others, or collaborate in a classroom setting. Um, and it supports PDFs. It uses Redium for EPUB support. So we contribute a lot of what, what we do with Redium back to the project. Um, we can deploy it in the cloud. It's in the browser. It's for the web. Um, we have mobile apps that synchronize for offline, for offline support. And I'm just going to give a quick demo of what I've been talking about. Having to switch again. Sorry about that. So here we have a PDF book, and it's been pre-added. It has pre-added annotations. Um, this is a demo. Um, you can click on that. It takes you to a link. 
Um, and uh, we can detect links inside the PDFs to do, to do that, or the user could add their own links. You know, you could create inline comments to start a discussion among the readers of the book. And like I mentioned, the rectangular regions pops up with a video um, and, you know, other things like that. So now let's talk about our vision for the future for our, you know, I've kind of already set the, set the stage with all of what we're doing with NYU and, and Hypothesis, but we want to we wanna co come to the, you know, the, um, maybe become part of the coalition, I don't know, um, with our product as well. So our ecosystem changes that we could make for Active Textbook are we could add in uh, hypothesis support to not just support book level annotations, but you know, at a global um, as a global provider of annotations. Uh, we want to align our technology so it becomes interoperable with other tools. And one of the things to do that is to support the W3C's uh, web annotation data model, uh, so our APIs could export that and so on. Uh, we want to also import export annotations, for example, with Hypothesis. Um, and um, yeah, so thanks, thanks for your time. And th this is the first time I've attended an I Annotate conference, so I'm pretty happy to be here. And thank you, everybody. Hi, I'm Kathy Fletcher. I'm from OpenStax, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the little bit that we're doing with annotation right now and our ideas for the future. And uh, hopefully we can talk more about that this afternoon. So just briefly, if you don't know what OpenStax is, I'm going to give you two slides, only two slides, on marketing who we are. Um, OpenStax is an organization, we're, we're basically a publisher of open textbooks. These textbooks are published under a Creative Commons by attribution license. So that's the most flexible reuse license. We have 27 textbooks in the first two years of college that hit a bunch of really, really basic topics, chemistry, physics, sociology, psychology, economics. We've got a business series that's gonna come out in the next uh, two years. So we, we are a publisher of books. We're supported by a group of foundations that have poured in about $20 million to uh, create this library of textbooks. And, um, uh, so far, 1.7 million students have used these books. That's, we try really hard to make sure that's an undercount. So that's a faculty member who has come to us, registered with us, and said, this is how many students I have. So that's how we get to that number. So anybody who just downloads the book from the web for, and doesn't register, we're not counting them. So they've saved about $160 million. Again, we're trying to be conservative, so we're not like assuming that these textbooks are the highest price that students are paying. Some students are paying $300 for a textbook, so we're estimating about $100 per textbook for that savings. So that gives our um, sponsors, the people who put the money in, six times return on their investment just with the people we can actually count, for sure. About 35% of degree-granting institutions use these textbooks. Um, physics, which is one of our older, and by older I mean five years old, textbook um, is in the top three of textbook adoptions. And for maintaining that library, we have um, partnership with a lot of different, it's not a lot of different organizations that do a variety of things. We have print partners that work with bookstores to print the books. We have partners that do homework systems that are based on these books and a variety of other things. And those partners um, 
contribute to sustaining this whole ecosystem so those books can be maintained, new versions come out, corrections, et cetera. So that's, that's who we are. What are we currently doing with annotation? So we have one small project in our research department to incorporate annotation into a research um, and uh, homework system called Tutor. So um, the questions that our team is trying to answer, so that's, this is a National Science Foundation funded research to look at how students highlight and how those highlights correlate with how well they do in the course. So are they highlighting good stuff? Are they highlighting the same things that other students in the class are highlighting? And what can we tell about their actual highlighting patterns that will let us gain, uh, gain insight into their understanding of the material? And then as a second phase of this research, looking at can we use natural language processing the highlights that students do, the group, you know, like the, the, um, the highlights that the group of students are doing to generate review questions for students and can we use um, our uh, cognitive science principles and research to give them those review questions in a spaced way so that they are retaining knowledge and retaining understanding. So that's our small project and we are using Hypothesis to integrate with this tool so that when students are doing their readings, we are capturing that. And um, over, over the, uh, it's a three-year grant, we'll be doing some of those other things to generate questions from that. So I'm gonna give you a brief tour, hopefully a quick tour of um, kind of the landscape that having this Creative Commons by attribution licensed content has created and then what we want to think about with that landscape with respect to annotations. So I'm going to use sociology as a case study and just give you a visual of where sociology lives and thinking about like we are kind of a, we are creating a distributed network of this content and then that actually creates some existential questions for us and, and also lots and lots of opportunities. Okay, so this is Sociology, the original at our site. This is the digital copy of this book. It's hosted at cnx.org, which is a part of OpenStax. This is what it looks like. We have an adapted version of this that we embedded a quizzing tool inside of. Um, the, the textbook is adapted. The actual, each section of the book is shared between those two and then some smart technology figures out, hey, what section of this book is this? What questions do we have that go with that section? And pops that in so students can do review and practice. So that's one, one other version that's still within the OpenStax ecosystem. This is BC Campus, which has a version of the sociology textbook that they adapted for the Canadian market for the Canadian students, so that it wouldn't have a whole bunch of US specific examples that were trying to illustrate culture and, and um, ex uh, examples, et cetera. This is what the book looks like there. That's hosted in Pressbooks. If any of you guys know Pressbooks, Pressbooks is um, another way of displaying the books, and it's using the same HTML that was produced, but looks a little bit different and they actually have to do a lot of work. The math titles are harder to get in than the non-math titles. Math is always hard. Um, sorry to quote Barbie. Anyway. Um, and they, th this particular example, the caption is re reworked and the text is significantly reworked. So thinking about annotating, we would love for annotations to show up even on adapted contents of books but you have to realize that some pieces of that are gonna to start to change and evolve as you move throughout this ecosystem of the content. Um, they also have some stuff that they haven't embedded into the textbook, but is really interesting material, which is case studies that faculty have produced to go with the textbook. So these are BC campus case studies. And these things actually live all over the place. They live basically in every faculty member's 
um, learning management system, they are developing these case studies and they go with the textbook. Um, Lumen Learning is um, another organization, for-profit organization that produces courses and they reuse OpenStax content. So this is the sociology book in Lumen. They also host using Pressbooks as the underlying technology. Here's what it looks like inside of Lumen. So pretty much the same. I don't know whether you remember the example, but you know, like they format a little bit differently. They actually reworked. And then within their course, they've added quizzes. They've added um, additional case studies and things like that that teachers use. They've added laboratories, et cetera. And then finally, in this distributed ecosystem, we actually produce PDFs. And um, a, a, a lot of usage is coming through those PDFs. Faculty are downloading that PDF, uploading it into their learning management system. Every student is downloading that PDF. And that's, you know, we're, we're causing that spread. Um, I went to Canvas, the main site for Canvas, which is a learning management system, very popular learning management system. I think it's just behind Blackboard. And they have a set of public open courses. And I just searched for sociology. And I found this sociology course, which is using the OpenStax book. And then I clicked on that link. I don't know whether you can see it, because I remember when I was at the back of the room, I couldn't see stuff. But it says OpenStax College Intro to Sociology, Chapter 1. Click on that link. That actually goes to Sailor. And Sailor is hosting their own copy of this. So they've hosted that if you, again, probably can't see that link, but the link inside that green box, that's Sailor's copy of that chapter of the book. So that's the landscape of where all these books are, just for one, sociology. So what are we thinking about doing with annotation? So I'm going to talk about, and this is the part where I'm going to go back to something you can't see because it doesn't exist yet. These are the questions we have. OK, can we use annotation to foster meaningful conversation and sharing around these textbooks? Because they're all, they're, people are sharing stuff around these textbooks, but not necessarily in a very connected way. And then we have some existential questions that all of this distributed use of the OpenStax content creates. And one of the, the existential questions are, you know, I showed you that number at the beginning, that 1.7 million students who are using our content. Well, we only know that if somebody comes to OpenStax.org, if a faculty member comes and says, yeah, I'm adopting this textbook. And we have ways, I mean, we, we keep some answers, answer keys and things like that to try to, try to encourage them to come and tell us. But that's limited. As these textbooks spread in, in ways that are super useful to be using, we're going to not know that. And then we're not telling our uh, foundation funders, hey, what their impact is of their social investment. So that's a big deal. Um, and uh, we also have this sustainability model that we've built off of having partners who know and um, can advertise what they're doing on top of this content. And we also have things that we do on top of that content. So how do we, can we, so the, the, the question is, can we use annotations as a way to measure the impact of this distributed network of the content? And can we use it, and this maybe is sneaky, I don't know, but can we use it as a way to actually encourage people to come back to OpenStax and to come see what OpenStax has. So um, we have two interns this summer that are going to just do a series of explorations. And what we want is for them to build, we have a bunch of interns, but these are the two that are getting to do this, these prototypes. We want them to build some prototypes so that we can show what this might look like, to see if it's even interesting, to see if it's compelling, that kind of thing. So there's some, some things that we want to try. One, we have a very traditional errata, report errors, and corrections process. Every two years, 
Um, the PDFs, or every year, the PDFs of the books get updated. The digital content is updated every couple of months because it takes a little while for that to go back to the subject matter experts to make sure that the corrections are correct. So we have a very traditional process, but could we use an, an annotation tagged with errata throughout all those different copies? Could that actually come back to us? And could corrections get pushed out through annotations so that somebody knows, hey, there's a new version of this, and it's, it's got a lot of improvements. Anyway, so that's one, one experiment. Um, another experiment is, could we use it as a way for the community to advertise additional resources that go with it? So the books are all modular. Each section of the book is its own URL, its own address. So somebody can say, hey, there's this really great video, or Hey, this sim, we, like our physics book uses simulations from uh, Colorado Boulder, the FET simulations, they're fantastic. Two of those are being made accessible and they would like to make more of their simulations so that if somebody comes to this, and this is not easy to do, this takes a lot of work. If somebody comes to this sim and they're blind, how do you make that, uh, that exploration, that laboratory experience actually work for them? So that takes some work. Well, what if that didn't get updated in your copy of the book? Could we use annotation as a way to say, hey, there's this great new resource that's going to make this experience better for these students? Can we use that to attach those case studies that are localized to all kinds of different ways? So those are some other ideas. And then can we even use annotation possibly as a way to connect the textbook experience to physical locations. So if you are nearby a museum in San Francisco or a museum in Houston, could you have an annotation that shows that there's something that goes with this course you're taking right now? Hey, walk into the Science Museum and check out that, um, that exhibit on evolution because it goes right with the chapter we're in right now. Those are... Uh, just ideas. And then um, a third, third exploration that I want them to work on is um, assessments. Because we have, you know, the books come just like a traditional disc book with a bunch of assessments. But could we have this as a way to attach flashcards, quizzes, things that the community's generated just in time when a student needs it when they're reading a particular section? So, um, if you are interested in that and you want to work with these interns, let me know. If you want to advise them, let me know. I think I've, anyway, that's it for me. Hi, I'm uh, Nathan Lisko. Um, I'm a developer at eLife. Um, we're an open access journal um, that's online only. We're funded by HHMI, the Wellcome Trust, and Max Planck Institute. Um, I've been there for three years. Um, our mission is uh, ambitious, um, and it, it goes beyond our own shores. Um, we don't just want to um, solve problems that meet our needs uh, and the needs of our users, but we want to help the ecosystem. Um, so I'm eager to talk with anyone um, where our um, goals and aspirations align, and then we can work together. Um, and another shout, shout out to the Annotating All Knowledge Coalition. This has been a, a real driver for our uh, prioritizations in, in incorporating annotations into our platform. We want to ensure that we're investing time into things that are sustainable, um, interoperable. And um, our executive director attended uh, Force 11 last year, and um, he came away very energized. Um, the discussions he had there have fed into the work that, that we've been doing with Hypothesis. Um, I'm just, I just wanted to, this was one of his slides at Force 11, um, and I just um, included it because it, it gives an indicator of the progress that we've made since that time. 
So some of the possibilities that they uh, discovered um, at Force 11 that Mark was involved in the discussions with other, other scholarly publications um, is the opportunities to have journal clubs and, and ask the author sessions. Um, I think that's one of the, the, the ones that our editor-in-chief, Randy Sheckman, is really um, passionate about, the ability to, uh, if the author is willing, uh, to engage with um, the readers of the publication of the of the article and we envisage perhaps opportunities where there can be live dialogue on the article um, and, and other other possibilities it was really interesting to see the presentation by e-journal press um, and the possibilities that that can bring uh, to uh, uh, surface more of the kind of meta knowledge um, the, the dialogue that's happening in the peer review process uh, and if there are opportunities to, can we publish that and can that help to um, advance uh, the, the scientific method? Can it help to uh, advance the knowledge around an article? Some of the barriers that we had to integrate in the um, annotator tool into our website, um, we needed the ability to authenticate around um, a third party account because we, as a publisher, we've got other ideas and other ambitions, annotations one of them, but we want to build <laughs> Um, kind of author profiles and um, help to uh, sort of motivate and draw attention to good behaviors around science and so annotation is one of these uh, things that can help uh, with that but we also um, uh, wanted uh, kind of contributors to that dialogue to be um, uh, willing to not be anonymous if they wanted to have that dialogue on our channel. We're not discouraging people from commenting on it, um, on our article from the public domain, um, being anonymous or using pseudonyms. Um, but um, we wanted to have some edit editorial control to um, ensure that there's a high quality of dialogue on the eLife um, annotation channel. Uh, so to that end, we need to be able to moderate. Um, and we also, we've put some effort um, through our product team to um, engage with our users already, um, even before uh, kind of kicking off the work with Hypothesis to ensure that the annotation tool could, could work for our users. So we've been able to feed back uh, some kind of UX improvements and um, uh, that, that's led to us being able to make some customizations, uh, just mild customizations to kind of improve the experience. Um, I am going to do a demo uh, now. Um, I, uh, hopefully the Wi-Fi can... It's been holding up really well over the conference. I just want to congratulate the people who've been doing that. That's uh, kind of a, a big stress for attendees, and so thanks for that. I'd, I'm probably jinxing it right now. but um, So everything I'm about, about to demo, I just didn't um, uh, kind of... Uh, rely upon side knowledge and, and sort of quiet conversations to get this working. All the documentation is already available on the Hypothesis website in the Read the Docs. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna kick off the demo. Just gonna change my display. So those familiar with the eLife Sciences website, this isn't our current live site. This is um, the next version that I've been actively working on um, with the other, uh, other members of the development team, and this should be live in the next month or so. Um, so you can see we've got the um, Hypothesis client integrated into our site, but rather than having um, sort of public group as the default, we want to lead people to the um, editorial uh, controlled space, e the eLife publisher group. So that's an, a new feature that we can uh, configure the client to divert to that. Um, and then um, we encourage people to log in. Now this is directing us rather than the hypothesis login, it's the login for our, webs web our website. So I'll just log in. and then it's directed the user back to the um, article page. I'm now logged in and I can highlight and annotate and that's not new obviously, that's not new features. 
So that's published it to our group, uh, and that's public. Uh, that's the uh, moderation level that we want it to go for. We will um, moderate after the fact, um, but we understand that as other people want to integrate this functionality in their website, perhaps they want a different moderation model, but this, this is going to work for us. Um, so that's, uh, I've left a comment, I can flag my own or flag other people's comments and that will alert um, a moderator on our side um, and then uh, by email. And I'll just log out and log in as a moderator and just show you the experience and then I'll just show you a couple of other UX improvements that we've been able to make um, and then I'll, I'm nearly, there's not much else to, to show you. Um, So the moderation happens in the same client as well. I don't need to log into Hypothesis to do that. I just log into my system and one user has been designated as a moderator. And then if a piece of content has been flagged, I can hide it. Um, the other features uh, that I just want to draw your attention to, it, it, it may be hard to see here, but the um, the, the colors and uh, fonts um, have actually been selected by us. Uh, so that they can match the branding of the website. Um, and the comments, uh, yeah, the comment number here, that's a new feature that they've added so that you can just add a bit of markup on your site and then the JavaScript can come along and, and uh, bump that up a number once there's a new, a new comment. Um, yeah, that's, re that's it really for the demo. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm hearing a lot of kind of interesting ideas, even those n not uh, directly in the field that I'm in um, and I, my brain has just been going everywhere just thinking about the possibilities and thinking about the the links uh, for our own data the models uh, that, that exist already within publishing that uh, would allow us to kind of uh, harness the annotation model in new ways if you're seeing uh, things that we can collaborate with you on uh, we're an open access journal and we're open in many ways we like to share a lot of the code that we do all of the code for our website will be publicly available as well um, and uh, yeah so basically if there's anything that we're doing that we can that you can use go for it and also if you're seeing this as, as a kind of an interesting use case and you want to um, uh, all of our content we want it to be as mineable and as usable as possible it's it's published in a, under a very permissible license so um, if we're not doing things in the way that makes it easy for you to mine our data and uh, and get the most from it, then please talk to us. That's it. Here we go. Hi, I'm Drew Winget. I'm from a department of Stanford Libraries called DLSS, Digital Systems and Services. And uh, we're a group of a couple dozen engineers who write open so uh, source software for libraries. Uh, one problem that we've been dealing with for a few years and been working on around annotation is annotating images. Uh, so I am a maintainer and early developer on a project called Mirador, which is a piece of open source software that allows uh, collections of deep zoomable images to be brought in from multiple institutions interoperably and compared and annotated. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the, the background of this problem and um, what Stanford is doing to address this and then how it connects with uh, publication and hopefully the, the future of annotation in research. Um, so the problem kind of began with the fact that uh, images are really important for many types of research and libraries have a lot of extremely high resolution image data that can't be easily given to researchers to, to use in their research. And this sets up um, an asymmetry where uh, some scholars at, at um, well-resourced institutions are able to go and directly deal with certain books and uh, whole fields um, of researchers are not able to, to have access to the same materials. So you can see, for instance, uh, if, if you're interested in the materiality of a work like this, it's useful to have really high-resolution imagery. But it's really, really, really big. And it's too big to be sent over the web. So people began creating these tiling viewers that could uh, view these huge, huge works um, 
in one you know, sort of seamless interface without having to download all the pixels. You only download as many pixels as you actually need at the time that you're using the work um, as you scroll around. But we kept uh, the community of library developers kept re-implementing the same software over and over again. So we needed a standard for expressing this. And um, Rob Sanderson was, uh, who's here today, was uh, is basically the mastermind behind this. Um, so the standard that was created is called IIIF. And uh, there are a couple of APIs, but the one that lets us get these images is called the Image API. And um, the answer to unifying this in an interface uh, like this with, um, uh, with other works ended up being annotation. We needed a way to represent these things as uh, combinations of materials from all over the web with particular relationships. So to uh, get more into that uh, side of things, uh, I just want to show um, some things that, that uh, have recently been released in the Mirador project around annotation and show specifically how, how these relate to images. So um, in IIIF, there's a notion of a canvas or a blank space where uh, onto which images can be annotated. And this allows multiple images to be shown in a spatial relationship. So in this example um, from the Bibliothèque uh, Nationale de France, we have a uh, manuscript which has had its illustrations cut out of it. And they were sold on the streets of, uh, of cities of Europe for hundreds of years. And then uh, a university uh, finally found this, this, uh, this piece. So uh, you know, someone can say something like, uh, this is missing, sad face. And um, uh, that annotation can go off to a server somewhere. And if uh, they're in that research group, they can, they can know about it. Uh, but through the magic of annotation, uh, another institution can um, have digitized that resource and found it separately, and uh, then uh, annotate it directly onto that canvas, and it is still zoomable in the same space. So this manuscript has been reconstructed digitally. Um, and the same thing uh, has been done to allow um, images from different time periods uh, so images taken in the 90s, images taken in the early 19th century, multispectral imaging uh, to be brought into to a single interface like that. And uh, we have a really good example here with um, a book that, um, uh, that has a particular page, which I'll just bring up, uh, with many, many layers of multispectral imaging attached to it. Um, so you can see that in this case, um, this ink here uh, has a certain chemistry that when uh, exposed to infrared light uh, makes it invisible. And that tells us something about where that ink was sourced, uh, the history of the manuscript, and even who wrote this and, and, and when it was written. And if there were um, inaccuracies introduced, uh, who might have introduced those inaccuracies and when. So to cover the, uh, the publication part of this, um, I want to talk about how these uh, annotations get brought back in, because I feel like this is the part that is missing from publication. Uh, just going back to this, this old diagram from the, the W3C, it's this, this reintegration of that information that um, is really hard to achieve interoperably. And uh, one way that um, IIIF has, has addressed this is uh, by uh, representing the objects as, man, as um, as annotations, and as a result, we can uh, open something like this manuscript, and these aren't um, uh, going to be user annotations, but rather these are published directly with the objects by the library as a transcription, and that looks something like, like this as linked data. We can click that, and it's, it's a part of that published object. So I'm really excited by what I heard from the other panelists about this reintegration process and, and tightening this loop. Um, and I hope that that will continue. So at Stanford, we're, we're hosting a version of Mirador uh, for our scholars to use, and annotation is a major part of that. And it's all in open, um, open annotation and web annotation format, so it'll be interoperable with many of the, the other tools here, including Hypothesis, I believe, uh, very recent ad addition to Hypothesis. And um, as a broader vision, I, I just have to echo what some of the other uh, panelists have been saying, that I would actually like to see this um, relationship between publishing and annotation dissolve a little bit and the um, 
the scope of the definition of publication expanded so that um, uh, smaller things can be published and scholars can take credit for them. And I think it really, really matters the work that's being done here on this stuff because if you think of the, the way that a particular insight or a particular new piece of information, like a, some, a, simple, um, a simple novel phenomenon seen under a microscope uh, has on the whole cascade of the tree of, of knowledge, um, holding on to that small insight for three months um, to publish a paper and thousands of researchers doing that uh, means that millions of people will actually die sooner. And it, uh, and it really is important to, to close that loop and make sure that we, um, we, can, uh, we can make sure that, uh, that whenever someone has an insight, anyone who is concerned with a particular um, topic uh, that that insight pertains to is also notified um, according to this full vision. So I look forward to talking about that with you all. Thanks so much to all the panelists. I think we have a little bit of time before lunch to take questions. Not sure, is a uh, get back to Christoph, the human mic stand today. Welcome, Christoph. Certainly there must be questions. Hi, thank you to all the, the panelists. Um, I have a question about uh, the idea of the journal club that um, I think you were uh, referencing in your presentation. So the idea that, in a way, um, a variety of annotations can actually accelerate a discussion on a given research product, and we can do this in the open now, leveraging open annotation. So um, projects and platforms like uh, Academia have been bragging for years about how they provide a superior journal club experiences. And, and we know what's happening right now with academia, so I'm not gonna go over that. But um, I, I think there's something interesting to, to be learned from the fact that uh, these closed, like walled gardens, um, and these approaches to uh, annotation and discussion have uh, an advantage in terms of uh, social density, just social network density uh, that i not seen yet in an open um, infrastructure like uh, the one supported by open annotations. And they also have uh, the advantage of consistent UX, which is one of their selling points uh, to people who are joining them. So I'm curious from your perspective, given that we all believe that like these journal clubs, these discussions should be happening in the open because they're part of the scientific discourse, how can we uh, how can we uh, build systems that can provide a superior uh, UX and a superior uh, social density uh, to be able to achieve that goal? So um, I'll just remind you all that I'm, I'm a developer at eLife, but I do have a perspective on that. Um, and the vision for integrating um, annotation into our website is not, for, it's not realized yet. We don't know what it will be. Um, we want to facilitate. Um, we've been we en always engage with um, our content providers, uh, our authors, and, and internally we have a, a large reach, um, a lot of researchers. Um, so. We've got some interesting ideas that we know some of our authors are going to be super excited about and others are going to be less excited about. So I think the, once there's a few success stories and we see it happen and work, the hope is that it'll sort of snowball. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. It's kind of really vague. I'm, I'm not committing to anything, but we really want to be agile about this. Um, we've deliberately not... Um, implemented features that we're excited about and we know will be cool, but we, wanna, we want the use of it and the buzz around it to determine what the, the, the next features will be and the next activities will be, yeah.
I, I just have something really quick to say about that, which is um, that uh, keeping the, the representation of annotations decoupled from the user interface will really address part of that problem because um, what uh, I just came from a conference about Mirador where a lot of researchers are, uh, have extremely idiosyncratic needs and many of them are capable of building their own interfaces or, or working with people who can build an interface for their need. Uh, so that decoupling I think is an important thing to, to make available as well. And I'm not sure who this question is for. It's kind of, it's, it's been a very interesting um, panel because you have some folks that are kind of from the more traditional reader slash book slash journal kind of um, platform space and then starting to move into workflows as well. And all of those have that, that kind of that, that accompanying annotation need in there. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, as you guys are either you know, a traditional e-reader starting to put in more workflow stuff or just a workflow solution. Um, what are the differences in, as you're thinking about users and their annotation needs, what are the key differentiators that you're, you're finding you need to start changing in, in the way you think about annotation and what the users need as they move out of platform into workflow? That probably wasn't the best worded question, sorry. <laughs> well, I want to say something. We have. We, we built a product, like I was saying, it, it, to create workflows for individual users, students, or teachers. And we're just exploring about how that could break out, out of these gated areas and, and go into the open annotation space. So um, I don't know how much I could add, but um, it's, it's good to hear that, um, you know, these, that there's a wider community out there with annotations and then we, we, we should start looking into that. Um, and um, I just wanted to add that. Anyone else wants to say anything? Yeah. Kathy? Yeah, I'm curious just to see what OpenStax, because you guys are doing more now than just like creating a textbook. Right, you guys are doing, you guys are doing things like, let's see how the students are engaging with that textbook so that we can see what, what they're annotating so that we can build questions and frameworks and, and, and workflows right. around that. And feed that back in. So like, as you guys are starting to break yourself out of thinking I'm a content creator into I'm a workflow part of this ecosystem person and annotations a part of that, you know, how, do, how, how does that change? Like, what, what are the key things that you guys are, are, are focusing on like, that you didn't used to focus on two years ago? Yeah. Well, I would say, you know, just from the point of view of workflow, that really is the key to everything. And so when OpenStax started out, it was very focused on what is the workflow of a faculty member adopting a textbook and getting it to their students and a student either reading it or ignoring it. But you know that workflow was the whole workflow we were thinking about. And as we started to build more learning software around that, which we are also is, is supporting our research team and, and some of those investigations, we were still thinking what is that workflow, how does that fit into a classroom, um, some of the most interesting things that we've seen is that, you know, we were trying to take some research that there's a couple hundred years of support for, say, practicing, spacing your practice out over time. So we, we wanted to introduce this one tiny workflow change into what a classroom does, but still keep the classroom workflow traditional because you're introducing change at a pace that people can do. And it wasn't easy to do. I mean, the, the, the first comments that we got from some of this stuff were students saying, this looks broken. It gave me a question from chapter three when I'm on chapter six. And teachers saying, I don't have time for my students to go back to chapter three ever. And we're like, really? It's the same exact amount of practice, and it's way more effective if you do it in bits instead of doing it all you know, the day before the test, right? Like, as far as retention and knowledge. So those are some ways that workflow is really important. And all those explorations that I talked about with annotation, they all have a huge amount of workflow embedded in them. And I don't know the answer to that. I know it'll be key to figure out what's the workflow because somebody cannot look at annotations for errata and added resources and you know pop-ups about you know, you're nearby this museum. Those can't all happen all at once in the same way or it's just never gonna work. 
So yeah, we think a lot about workflow and, and it's hard to get right. <laughs> Sorry if I missed this, but this is a question mostly for NYU and eLife. So really cool integrations, very exciting. Like how do we know or how are you planning to mobilize your communities to, to make use of them? Like do you know that there's already people ready to annotate? Are there going to be events or how are you going to, you know, you've built it. Are they going to come kind of question? Yeah, I think um, what I've heard from talking with the eLife team is um, a, couple of the, a couple of the features that I mentioned in the presentation, one of them being Ask the Author, we're really excited about that. Um, I think with the current functionality, um, that dialogue is going to have to ha happen uh, like it, not in a concentrated period, but we do envisage a time where we'll be able to invite people to a session, a live session. Um, uh, we're pretty excited about what some of other journals are doing, posting they're getting articles um, published and then, uh, and then um, navigating a discussion on Reddit about the article, inviting the author to engage with the readership. Um, and, and we just want that to be happening in place in a, in, in, in a way that we can um, give a strong status to the comments that are, are being added. Um, so that's just an idea. Um, and, um, but it offers a lot of a lot of different opportunities. My, uh, the ex executive director, Mark uh, Pat uh, Patterson, one of the things that he was uh, really excited about, which I don't know uh, can be met by the current functionality, so we might need to do more work on it. Um, but that would be the idea that uh, there'd be um, kind of private study groups that were committing a period of time studying a piece of work um, and and then when they were ready or if they felt it was appropriate, then they could publish that and that, that could um, be on a, a separate channel to eLife as, as well, but, but that we'd be willing to publish it if it was um, on one of our articles. I would add that um, when... More? Hi. Um, as part of our... our grant planning for this project, we included uh, a marketing budget that goes directly to our university press, and they know what to do with a marketing budget. It's the, what they usually do with it. And so it, these, these collections will f roll into their normal process for, for making contact with faculty and, and getting adoptions for this, this set of materials. The, the other thing that we've done is we've, we've pulled a set of titles from the press that work well together, um, and so that that was also intentional on the part of the press that they they think they can manage adoptions better because these these this set of of uh, this corpus interacts with with itself. Um, just a couple clarifying questions from my side. Um, I know that when it comes to timelines. They're always a little bit fluid, and I hate to ask people to commit to a timeline, but generally, when, what time frame might we expect the Redium integration to be done? Well, Because um, everyone's so excited about it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, we're, we're working with you guys, and we're working with NYU, and the timeline is kind of up in the air. Um, we're, we're hoping that we, need, we, we can finish our integration and get everything contributed, but I don't really know. Maybe it's in the timeline is in within weeks, not not months. So, um, yeah, and not years, of course. Well, that's good. We've we started about so we started exploring ideas in January, but the project really took off um, mostly in April and March. And so, I mean, we've done a lot of, of the work. We've gotten ourselves uh, integrated and used to the hypothesis code base. We're already pretty familiar with, with Redium, so we just need to get our stuff uh, all working together and, you know, you know, contributed back, and everything will just start to fall in place, and you'll start seeing, um, you know, 
the foundation level support on the uh, EPUB side for hypothesis starting to work. It could be used to not just target Redium at the end, it could also use uh, EPUBJS could use this as well. Um, so, you know, things are just going to fall into place and, um, you know, it organically, I hope. Well, thanks everyone uh, for. Is this fun? Thanks everyone for a, a really interesting and, and diverse uh, selection of uh, use cases. Um, in terms of the question on how do you get authors to use a tool, again, I'll put a plug in for an unconference session on that this afternoon, and remind you that if you have other unconference ideas, um, certainly during lunch break and, and during uh, the education panel this afternoon, don't hesitate to add them to the white papers in the back of the room, and um, Nathan will yeah, don't stand up and walk away yet, though. Thank you. Clap. <laughs>